Joining us this morning, Tatiana Jordan. Tatiana Jordan. I get the name right. Jordan. Tatiana. Tatiana. Okay. It's Tatiana Jordan. So we've got Mitzi Hill here with Taylor English, uh, a woman with a wealth of knowledge and experience in the cybersecurity and leadership space. I'm really excited to have you here today. Thank you. Um, I think a great place for us to start and something that people watching will, will want you to answer mm -hmm. um, is why cybersecurity is important for companies of all sizes, not just the Coca-Colas, AT&Ts, and T's, AT and T's mm -hmm. um, Home Depots, et cetera. Uh, so why it's important, and then once you've convinced everybody out there why it's important, you know, what can they do about it? Right. Well, I think we all hear about cybersecurity a lot these days. The headlines are very scary. Yes. Um, they tend to be driven by incidents at companies with a global footprint, a global reputation, who have been attacked by somebody from the outside. And that is all terrible, and it should make us pay attention. But the reality is that for most companies, they don't have a global footprint. They're not really a target for outside attackers. But everybody who operates a company is on a computer network these days, and so there is a level of vulnerability. Um, and everybody has employees and people, human beings, in their shop, in their business, at all levels, high and low. And even if all of your employees are uniformly content and productive and honest, um, there can be problems with people who lose their laptops or get their cars broken into and their phone is stolen. And if that device has a tunnel into your network, it can present some problems for your company. Yeah. And the reality is that most companies have people in them who wouldn't necessarily fulfill our highest goals for humanity. Um, <laughs> and so uh, eloquently. <laughs> and so um, having some good practices in place to account for the fact that all of us from time to time are lazy or careless or angry about how we've been treated by our employer or angry at a fellow employee um, and may want to strike out in a way that we know how to do if we have access to the company um, online accounts. Uh, we can, you know, I've seen companies that had to fend off um, fraudulent supply orders based on their office supply account or companies that have an email list manager that, you know, a former employee still has his credentials and logs in and starts sending out abusive emails to customers oh, of, gosh. of my client. Um, and then there are also things most companies have either secret or confidential or sensitive information about other people, their customers, or they have secret confidential information about their business. So it could be that I have your bank account number, or I have your credit card number, or I have my own employee's social security numbers, and I have my own pricing and customer lists and inventory plans and things like that that I don't want to get out. And so whether you're looking at it with a dim view which is there will always be people who want to harm you inside or outside your company and for most companies it's the insider we worry about or you look at it from the standpoint of no one wants to harm me but bad things do happen that's so true um, I think it's prudent to recognize that if you have information that's stored electronically someone can get to it and it can get out even if it's just wow I accidentally attached that spreadsheet to my email and sent it out and it had all of the company's um, social security numbers on it. Yeah. And that can be hugely disruptive. Um, I just helped a client who had a relatively small amount of information that got accidentally emailed by a senior company official to a relatively small group of people, but we decided that it was something the company had to address legally. And it took two months of time and it probably resulted in $40,000 in legal fees. Oh. Somewhere, that may be a little high. Um, and it was, you know, there was another vendor who was involved in sending out the notices to the affected people saying your information has been compromised. And that was probably another $35,000. And you have to get your insurer involved. Um, 
So you've now called your insurer and probably your lawyer and maybe your PR firm and you may have to decide whether this employee who accidentally sent the email can stay with you or should not stay with you. You're probably going to look at your internal policies and say, what should we be changing on an IT level or from a workflow personnel level right. to, to keep this from happening? And it's, a, it's very disruptive and costly to do that in response to an incident as opposed to doing some of that on the front end. Absolutely. So two key things I think that are important for people to take away from that point is one, uh, would you say a majority of hacks or compromises in cybersecurity happen because of insiders within a company, whether it's malicious or accidental human right. error, mm -hmm. versus some, you know, sketchy underground company trying to hack into your stuff. It's it's inside job. It is inside job, yeah. and and it may be inside job in that somebody just it was late and they hit the wrong button. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not planned. It's not malicious, but it does happen, and all of us do it. We've all replied all on something we shouldn't. <sighs> or address the email to, you know, Joe Smith instead of Joe Sullivan mm -hmm. or, you know, with the mm -hmm. autofill or something like that. And and those kinds of things can be really costly disruptive mistakes and they may mean that you've now let information out into the world that you had a duty to keep, you know, to yourself. And you or can't that, take back. And you can't take it back. Yeah. Or that you really wanted to keep to yourself. <laughs> For your own purposes, <laughs> right? right? Confidential. You know, if you're a small company and you're looking to be bought, you want to convince investors that you're buttoned up, that you govern yourself like a grown-up, that you've got all of this company secret sauce well protected. So there are a lot of reasons to look at it. And then I'd like to get to what you can do about it in a second. But before that, my first thought while you were talking um, is just the, the non-disclosure that you sign when you join a company. Mm -hmm. um, does that not cover, I guess, the employee or the employer? Like, h how does the non-disclosure you sign help or hurt both parties? And then let's get into the, you know, what, what can you do about it as a company? I think the non-disclosure is one of the things you can do about mm -hmm. it as a company. So I'm glad you asked about that. Mm -hmm. it's, a great, it's a great tool and, and it is one of the things that any company can do of any size that is it's a no low tech, <laughs> low cost, <laughs> low interference, yeah. right? It, there is very little reason not to do it. Yeah. Um, having said that, it's really only effective when somebody deliberately does something that mm -hmm. they weren't supposed to do. Right. So if you have a former employee who's angry or disgruntled because they've been terminated or you, they didn't agree with your decisions and they left or whatever, and starts leaking secrets like posting uh, social security numbers on a, on a social media website. And I'm, I'm giving you examples that are all things that I've, I've dealt with. Okay? Wow. Um, then you have several tools you can use to go after that former insider or that current insider and your, in, your NDA, your non-disclosure would be one of them. Um, it, it isn't as helpful when someone does something by accident. Yeah. Um, although it is, it is one of the things that I, th I think many companies would do well to cultivate kind of a, a culture of preserving and respecting confidentiality of the company and of their customers and employees. And having employees sign an NDA when they're onboarded is one of the things you can do that helps establish that culture, mm -hmm. that helps to say, we as a company, from the top down, this is something we take seriously. We yeah. are the custodians of customer information or vendor information or employee information, and it is important to us that those things be treated well. Yeah, and so beyond an NDA, mm -hmm. what can you do about it? Well, I think um, there are a couple of prongs of things, and the NDA falls into the prong of employee training and awareness. Make sure your policies reflect that your company uh, values confidentiality and privacy of personal data. Um, make sure that those apply to your employees and that you conduct training periodically to remind employees that they are also the custodians of information yeah. and they have a duty to tell you if they accidentally send something out or if they forget to lock their computer at night and find that a file is missing or something like that. Um, you also can um, ensure that you have 
reviewed what kind of confidential data your company has. Do you gather emails from customers? Do you have credit card numbers from somebody? Social security numbers from employees? All of those third party pieces of information plus whatever your own confidential information is. Map it out and figure out what do we have, why do we have it, and who has access to it. And then you can start working backward and saying, do we need all this stuff? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Uh, do we need to keep it all forever once we've right. kept it? Maybe not. Does everyone have to have access to it? Maybe not. So those are some things. And then also very simple, low-tech kinds of IT um, actions, such as requiring a password if employees are allowed to connect on this, mm -hmm. um, requiring that when an employee leaves, you have the ability to wipe this remotely and get all the company information. Before they it. leave the Exactly. There campus. should be an onboarding and an exit kind yeah. of process that deals with not just their keys and their badge, but also any of their devices that you've either issued to them or authorized, and any credentials they have for outside accounts mm -hmm. of yours, like the office supply company, the email Mailchimp manager, the anything. HR portal, yeah. if you've got a, you know, the ADT payroll portal, any of those kinds of things, those credentials need to be issued to one person only, or e sorry, each person's credentials need to be good for that person only. Mm -hmm. And when that person leaves, those credentials need to be no good. Yeah. There are many other things. And then, and then there are broader things you can do as a business, such as planning ahead for an incident. You know, what would we do if we got hacked or if we found out that an unencrypted laptop with all of the company's information on it was, was stolen from a taxi? Mm -hmm. um, who would we call? Do we have a PR agent? Does that person know that we're going to call them? Do we have a lawyer? Does that person know that we're going to call them? How do we communicate with each other if our email system has been compromised? Do we have phone numbers for each other? You know, that's not terribly advanced or complicated kind of planning. It's detailed. But it's details and it requires doing it and then it requires revisiting it. Mm -hmm. And as your company is lar gets larger, the scope or risk presented by the information you hold gets more complex. You may need to do more things than that, but those are the kinds of things I think any any company can do. Absolutely, and as you were talking about the, the policies and procedures companies can have in place, you know, if you are a company that has that tr truly has to have the social, the email, et cetera, you know, just make sure that stuff isn't stored in the same place. Yes. Have, you know, different servers, so that way if one thing is compromised, everything isn't compromised. That's also a part of your planning. Yes. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about resources. Obviously, okay. people want to know the what, where, who, how. So let's talk about some resources that should be utilized. Okay. Um, I think you will find from a purely legal standpoint that if you, if you ever are hacked or compromised in any way and you have customers or employees or other disgruntled people coming after you, you cannot say IT fell down on the job. That may have been an okay excuse 10 years ago. <laughs> um, that no longer flies. And so from a, from a planning and presence perspective, this is now a C-suite job. Mm -hmm. And if you're a large company and you have a C-suite and a board, they all need to know what your planning is and how often you revisit it and they all need to have a role in it. Mm -hmm. If you're small, one or two people running your company, it obviously isn't going to be that complicated. But um, you need to be sure that you have someone who can stop the leak if there is an outside attack or an insider who's doing something to you. You need to know that you can call someone and say, um, get our insurer on the phone. Do we have cyber insurance? Does it cover this particular thing? You know, our computers have been locked down by an outsider. We can't get to any of our data. Um, do you have, so, so resource-wise, knowing who you would need to call is important. For most companies, that's going to be some combination of the executive floor or team, um, a PR, function, a legal function, an IT function, and then there are going to be other players like your insurer and uh, maybe outside vendors like the people who draft and send the notices like we talked about earlier. And so Mitzi, uh, um, as partner at, at Taylor English, you are serving under the legal function Correct. of that resource team. And so let's talk more about what, what that role entails. How will you be serving those people who unfortunately, but fortunately come to you? 
So I, I work in a couple of different ways, mm -hmm. and um, some of it is reactive. A company calls and says, we've got a problem, right? Which is the most common. Mm -hmm. um, most of us don't buy new tires until the old one <laughs> blows, right? It's so timely and relevant. Or, or get a new roof until we can stand outside and say, this is the storm, it's going to fall on the roof. And that's how most of us approach our cyber planning as right. well, right? And so most of the calls I get are to say, help, whoops, yes, exactly, help. And what we do in that case is we say, all right, is it still happening? Um, is the leak still happening or have we identified it and stopped it? Um, what, what information was compromised? Can we figure that out? Um, was it in the clear? Was it not in the clear? I Meaning, you know, was it encrypted? Was it in a form that anybody out there could see it? And what was the information and who did it concern? Because from a legal standpoint, when you're reacting, one of the first things you have to know is what information is it? Is it legally protected by any laws out there? And if so, what laws are they and what do they say about how you have to respond? And that can be different based on the kind of information. And they change. And they change. And it can be different based on the residence of the affected person. So if you have customers in 10 states and their bank account numbers get out, you have to look at the laws of all 10 of those states to decide what you're supposed to do. And it may not be quite the same in every state. Um, and so there, there's all that. And then you start having internal conversations about how do we disclose this? Through what channels do we disclose this? In what detail do we disclose this? Do, is it done? And can we say it's done and here's what we found? Or is it an ongoing problem in, in which case how do you characterize that? So those are some of the things that go into the legal response. And then there's a lot of housekeeping in terms of you know, drafting speeches for the executives and looking at press releases and um, working with the insurance provider to make sure that there's coverage for the response you want to make. If you're required to send notices out, how much is it going to cost you and does your policy cover that kind of thing? Um, if your computer systems have been affected, do you have to replace them and does your policy cover that kind of thing? So those are some of the things that go into a response and it takes time um, and often, if you have had information compromised, you will be on a, on a clock. Many of those state laws we talked about will tell you you have to get the information, you have to notify affected individuals within 30 days or as soon as possible or something like that. And so you're kind of under some pressure. On the flip side, um, from a legal standpoint, the other thing I can do is help companies plan in advance. Which is so much better. <laughs> It's better for a couple of reasons. One is all of that mess and panic that happens when you've had a problem, you can m minimize because now you have a plan for who do we call and in what order and you know we know our insurance is going to cover it, we know we've got somebody who's going to help, all of those kinds of things, so you're not scrambling. Um, you've decided in advance, oh yes, we need to stop the bleeding first. That's priority one. And then we you know, start doing these other things. Um, the other way a plan is helpful is that it shows if you ever are involved in a lawsuit or a regulatory investigation because of a problem, it shows that you've thought in advance about what these problems might be and how to address them for your business based on the particular risk profile of your yeah. business. You're proactive versus reactive. That's exactly right. And right now in the United States, we have kind of murky legal standards on all of these questions. And so there isn't, I can't as a lawyer tell you, you must do this or else the right. following will happen. What I can tell you is if you don't do this, you don't have a very good story to tell on the back end. And you're already in a mess and scrambling to respond to the incident yeah. itself. And being able to say, I know how I'm going to respond, and here, here are the decisions I made, and here's why I made them, I think is important if you ever have to answer to a third party authority about it. Well, Mitzi, you are clearly so knowledgeable about all these issues surrounding both uh, preparedness and then how to respond to an incident like this. Um, one thing that we talked about off camera that I think will really make people's ears perk up is um, is privilege yes. uh, regarding a security audit. Right. So listen in right now <laughs> if you've like gone to get coffee or something, you're going to want to hear this. Yes, always privilege is going to be the sexiest part of the conversation. <laughs> um, the uh, that pre-planning that you're doing, 
um, one of the real benefits of it, if you ever have a problem down the road, is that you will be making decisions not in real time and not in an emergency about how to spend your company's money. We have found the following vulnerabilities. It would cost us, you know, X thousands of dollars to address all of them. We think our money is best spent spending some fraction of X on these things, right? You've, you've now made a decision about what you're not going to fix. When you're doing that on the front end before you have a problem, and if you have your lawyer involved in that discussion, which is usually you have a tech vendor come in and do a security audit of your system and you have a lawyer working with that tech vendor. Those discussions about what problems you're not going to fix arguably become legally privileged, which means Boom. that they are protected <laughs> from third party discovery if you ever have a problem down the road. So now, if you discovered 10 problems and you decided to fix three of them and you had a rationale for it, and some, sometime down the road, you have a hack or an employee issue or something that causes a problem under number seven. The regulator or the plaintiffs may ask for your decisions about item number seven on your list. And now you have an argument to say you shouldn't be able to see that. Um, because, and the way that privilege works is that it's, it, it's a function of legal advice and confidentiality, and it doesn't apply in every single setting. It right. doesn't apply to every single conversation you have with a lawyer, and it certainly doesn't apply to every single conversation where you merely think about your lawyer. And so <laughs> setting it up with some structure is important, and you really can only do that when you're planning in advance and not when you're responding to an incident. Absolutely, and it's not meant, obviously, to be a manipulative thing, but no. truly a, a protectionary measure you know that's it's, right. you're just so vulnerable as a company to so many different variables you can't possibly think of everything so that privileged aspect is just one more way of breathing easier at night I think that's right because what it what it allows you to do is make real decisions about how your company should be operating based on the variables you know that you can control mm -hmm. and not thinking about it necessarily from a liability standpoint and then not having somebody second guess that decision later. That's really what it's about, is giving you the freedom to say, this is the right decision operationally and legally and from a PR standpoint based on what we know right now, but then not having somebody question it later because they can't get to your decision making process. Absolutely. Um, so Mitzi, you clearly have a lot of your plate, a lot of responsibility, a lot of people and organizations you have helped over the years. Um, and we both know that life will just throw things at you. Yeah. It, it's not like you just show up to work and you're like, everything's great, gonna knock it out and leave it five today. Right. So you've had some life challenges um, over the past year. I see there's a, a pin on your chest. There is. Uh, for ALS. Mm -hmm. Talk about um, your experience and how you, you know, hold it together as best you can while doing all that you do. Um, I appreciate you asking and giving me a chance to talk about it. My dad, who was only 72, was diagnosed with ALS in December of 2016. ALS is a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. You may know it better as Lou Gehrig's disease. And it is a truly terrible debilitating disease that essentially shuts down all of the voluntary muscle activity in your body over time, meaning that as your disease progresses, you can't um, hold things or use your feet or walk or talk or swallow, um, ultimately you can't breathe because the muscles that power your lungs will no longer work. And my dad's was particularly aggressive and fast moving and he died seven months after his diagnosis. Um, it was truly horrific and not something I, I would love to see a world where no one ever has to hear that their loved one has been diagnosed with ALS. My dad was very brave and we were all there with him throughout it, um, but it is a truly horrifying disease. Um, while that is all going on though, you know, we still have jobs to do and people counting on us in various areas of our lives, and so I was very lucky in that I was able to spend time with my family in Savannah and my clients and my partners at work were extremely understanding and set me up to work remotely. And so I just kept office hours from the upstairs TV room at my parents' house 
with the bird clock that makes little bird call noises <laughs> on the hour, so it might be a cuckoo or a quail or what have you. Don't mind that. Right, in the background of my conference calls. Um, and, and, and I think one of the things I learned from it is that uh, the important things will make themselves known to you in very short order in your life. Um, and the other thing is that you absolutely cannot get through something like this without help. Um, my dad had a lot of help around him in the form of family and caregivers. Um, we had a lot of help around us in the form of our friends and our family. And then for me, professionally, I had a lot of help from my partners and my clients because they were understanding and they were flexible about deadlines and they were adaptable to whether I was in person or on the phone. Um, and I had a lot of help from my boyfriend. I mean, he made it possible for me to live in Savannah for part of the year while he kind of kept things going in Atlanta. Wow. Um, and it was, it was bar none the biggest challenge I've ever faced, and it was awful on more levels than I can ever explain, but it did make it clear to me that the people in your life who step up and help are the ones who matter, um, and it will be very clear very quickly who those people are. Um, and you need to leave room in your life to ask for help yes. when you need it and not be embarrassed to, to need the help because you just <laughs> don't know what's going to come your way. That's so true. Um, thank you to everybody who rallied around Mitzi and her family to help her get through that time. And yeah. um, obviously, they, they still need you around, you know, yes, to help. Too. It's, not, it's not over, it's no, just, it's you know, not. it's a process. Um, is there a particular organization? that you feel is really helping as much as possible with research in the field of ALS and Lou Gehrig's or any, like it's like, we wanna help, right? And I'm not right. a doctor, I'm not gonna find a cure, sure. but I'd love to donate. Is there something we can do to help financially or from a support standpoint? Absolutely, um, we, uh, we, ha we organized, my family organized a, a team to walk in the Walk to Defeat ALS yes, in Georgia. Yes, I've done that before. Oh, great. Yeah. And we raised almost $30,000. Boom, that's awesome. Um, it, was, it was really good. That was through the ALS Association of Georgia. Yes. Um, they provide services to ALS families and their patients in, uh, patients and their families in Georgia. There are approximately 600 ALS patients in Georgia. And then the nationwide umbrella organization, the, Ameri the ALS Association of America, ALSA, um, is more the research arm, and so they're funding research studies and things like that to help make sure that nobody has to deal with the diagnosis of ALS in the future. And that day will get here. It will, um, it, it will. It, you know, it will change somebody's life. Yeah. Well, we will um, pop some links below this video you're Thank watching you. in the description so that you can Thank support you. That'd be great. those causes because they're, um, I mean, I'm covered in goosebumps. They're, it's it's horrific and we need to do whatever we can and, and support those people and their families affected in any way we can. Um, you have some, some positive life lessons to share with all of us. You, yeah. you teach at Emory, right? I do, yes. So not only are you a partner at Taylor English, <laughs> but you teach at Emory and I'm sure do a lot of other amazing things and never sleep. Um, but let's, let's hear some of those life lessons. Sleep is important. That's a, that's a big <laughs> life lesson. That is sleep. a life lesson. <laughs> Get enough sleep. Get enough sleep. Um, yeah, I mean, I have been really lucky. Most of my career I've had good mentors, good leadership, good colleagues and partners around me. And through their example, you know, I have, I have learned some things, not just in the hard times, <laughs> but in the good times too. And, and one of the most important lessons, I think, and one that I try to share with my students is be, just be nice to people. Um, it <laughs> is, you know, I think a lot of us as we're coming through the educational system and focusing on our goals, you know, I need to get the good job and get out of school and, you know, start climbing the career ladder. We forget about the fact that there are going to be people around us that we need and will make our lives better for the most part. And so just be nice to people. Um, for one thing, it will make you feel better. Yeah. For another thing, you never know when you will need them. And they're more likely to help you <laughs> if they like you. <laughs> Um, so true. <laughs> than they are if you've been a jerk yeah. to them. Um, and, and, and so that sounds very simple, but day in and day out when you're stressed and you're busy and there are deadlines and there are pressures on you, it's harder to carry out 
than not some mm -hmm. days to just say hi in the coffee room or you know be, smile. be pleasant smile say hi in the elevator whatever it is um, from a from a more kind of technical and substantive standpoint I have a couple of thoughts one is um, everything can give you a lesson everything is a learning opportunity particularly when you're young in your career that um, are just starting out in your career you may work with somebody that you don't like <laughs> or you may work on projects that you don't care for and that's okay you know if you can look at it instead of feeling like I'm trapped working for this person or I'm trapped doing this kind of stuff if you can look at it and say I now know that I don't care for this management style or I now know that I don't care for this particular type of work that will serve you down the road when you're calling the shots <laughs> Always about so elegant. what you work on and who you work with and what kind of leader you want to be down the road. So right. You can either grow up and be the jerk or you can grow up and be the one that people trust and go to with their problems and you know and and value having in their lives. Um, and then that sort of, that kind of you can learn from everything leads me into, um, for me at least, an important part of my career and satisfaction and a feeling of success is never stopping learning. Yes, and it's so important. It, it keeps is. you young. It does, and it, and it keeps you unafraid, right? If you are willing to take on new things, if you are willing to say, oh, I've never done that before, but sure, I'd be happy to do that one. Um, you never know what you might learn. You never know who you might come into contact with that'll have an important role to play in your life um, or you in theirs. And, um, and it's just more fun and more interesting. And I think it, it makes you a, a broader professional and advice giver. The broader your experience is, the more informed your advice is going to be, whatever your field is, in, in my view. That's so sharp. Um, key life lessons for Mitzi Hill, both personally and professionally. Um, I can't thank you enough for, for your time, for coming here Thanks today. Thanks for having me. And for, and for sharing this knowledge with us, and um, hope to have you back. I'd love to come back. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mitzi. Okay.